Welcome to Heart Mindify. Before we start the show, just a reminder to share, rate, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it. And please give us a five-star rating. It helps us beat the big tech algorithms. I'm John Izzy. Change can be difficult for a lot of us, but when we understand what makes us tick, we develop a better understanding of who we are and begin a journey of discovering our best self. Join me for a free session at johnizzy.com. And I'm Kim Cordy, creator of the Emotion Chef Framework, an emotion management tool. Thoughts drive emotions and emotions drive thoughts, but it's our emotions that drive our decisions and behaviors. Find out more at kimcordy.com. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Knowing each other personally and socially for the past 10 years, Kim and John have joined forces, bringing years of experience and training providing a platform for growth and personal development, along with a little humor. John is the heart, Kim is the mind, and together they are Heart Mindified. Kim, I'm reporting the news again from West Virginia like I did last week, and it's not raining, but it's about 90, 95 degrees right now, so it's kind of warm, which leaves me a little exhausted with the weather and i find myself exhausted with a lot of things right now but anyway how are you doing i'm pretty good uh, good you know some things are looking up on this end of the coast and i'm happy to say we're not 95 degrees nor humidity so i'm happy well there you go weather is really important to us obviously right <laughs> that's for sure what i did do this week is pull out a book i read a while ago It's called Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. It's by Margaret Heffernan. Have you heard of it? Oh, yeah. I have the book. It's a great book. Isn't it? And I cannot recommend it enough. And I really think it's a good thing for people to read now more than ever. Why do you say that? I've been trying to make sense of what's going on in our political climate. And I call it political because the whole COVID thing has become so political. Both sides blame the other side for how politicized it is. But either way, it's political. Yeah, you're right. And I'm not talking about this because I'm taking a political stance. This is for me, this is not a political issue. This is not a religious issue. This is a social health issue. And the amount of worldwide consensus among the scientific and medical community is this a horrible disease, highly infectious, and we're seeing these high count of deaths, and yet people refuse to believe that it's true, that that wearing a mask is not not going to be the answer. It certainly ups if you wear a proper mask and you wear it properly, like there's enough out there to tell you that there's, there's certain parameters around it just because you cover yourself with a Kleenex is not going to do it necessarily. (laughs) Right. It's cut, but it's kind of like a condom. If you want to prevent pregnancy, you increase your chances greatly by wearing one, but it's not a hundred percent. Right. That's for darn sure. Yeah. So to me, it's like, well, everybody knows that. Nobody wants to have their doctor come in to the operating room with a sniffle and say, hey, you know what? It's my personal freedom to not wear a mask because I don't feel like I can breathe or I can communicate or I can do anything. And so I'm not going to wear a mask while I do surgery on you people would be appalled, right? But it's for that very same reason of not transmitting something to others is why we're being asked to wear a mask. So I just want to let you know, like, this is what's led me down this path to reopen this book. And it reminds me of 
a time where I had willful blindness. So let's just talk about maybe what willful blindness is and I and hop in, John, at any point in time if you want to just speak. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do it all. <laughs> no, I think you're right on. You know, it's it's before we talk about willful blindness, let me give you two things that happened today, this morning. I noticed that I was scrolling through my Facebook feed and I noticed that four of my posts, well, they weren't my posts. They were my comments about a post. Four of them have been removed because of untrue statements. So Facebook removed them, which I thought was kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And and then, which I, you know, personally believe that that was a good thing because Facebook removed fake news, which is, you know, something that um, is a hot topic right now anyway. And then the second thing that I did this morning or that um, raised my raised my attention a little bit was in face on Facebook, we have a group in this area called the um, it's the crime report. And it goes through all the crimes that have happened in the previous day as they're currently happening. And there was a post about a patient that died uh, 40 miles north of me. And they're saying that it's on the rise again in our area. And as I was reading the comments, it was like everybody was ignoring the fact that this person died. Now think about that for a second. They were ignoring the fact that a human being in our location has died. And all they did was politicize the entire threat. And I'm thinking to myself, why are you ignoring the obvious? Like, what's preventing you from showing compassion, showing empathy? And why do you feel that on this thread that is reporting the death of someone that their family is reading, they're going to read all this hateful speech coming out of everybody's mouths in the in the thread? And it kind of bothered me. And I, too, thought about this book, Willful Blindness, because of those because of those two things that happened today. It's almost as if we are believing in something so strong, and I think you alluded to it with emotion, but we're believing in something so strong that we're ignoring the other side of it. You know, you can't, there, there are two sides to a coin, right? There's a reason why we flip the coin in a football game, um, heads or tails, because there's another side. If we ignored the other side, then there wouldn't be a chance there. There wouldn't be there there wouldn't be a game started because we're ignoring the other side. So there's always going to be another side. We can choose to either ignore it or we can choose to look at it. And lately it seems that both sides of this political spectrum are ignoring the other side. And I think that's I I think they're doing it willfully. And and let's just talk a little bit about like the definition of it. And I'm going to actually quote from the book so that mm -hmm. that people kind of get where we're coming at from this. First of all, it got started with some legislation that was passed in the 19th century. It basically was saying that if you could have known and you should have known something instead that you strove not to see. So in other words, like, you knew what was happening over there, but you you knew your guys were killing people or doing whatever, but you just chose to ignore it, even though you knew it was true. So if you could prove that, then you were just as guilty because you chose to be blind to it. But when she's referring to the psychological phenomenon, and then here I'm going to talk about it directly from the book. She says, whether individual or collective, willful blindness doesn't have a single driver, but many. It's a human phenomenon to which we all succumb in matters little and large. We can't notice and know everything. The cognitive limits of our brain simply won't let us. That means we have to filter or edit what we take in. So what we choose to let through and leave out is crucial. 
We mostly admit the information that makes us feel great about ourselves while conveniently filtering out whatever unsettles our fragile egos and most vital beliefs. It's a truism that love is blind. What's less obvious is just how much evidence it can ignore. Ideology powerfully masks what, to the uncaptivated mind, is obvious, dangerous, or absurd, and there's much about how and even where we live that leaves us in the dark. Fear of conflict, fear of change keeps us that way. An unconscious and much denied impulse to obey and conform shields us from confrontation and crowds provide friendly alibis for our inertia. And money has the power to blind us, even our better selves. Powerful. So powerful. So powerful. Exactly. That, and, and I'm going to give you my personal example. I've got several examples of when this was true in my own life. And one of the most powerful moments of this that I can go back and look at is when my ex-husband was cheating on me. Pretty much everyone's like, how did you not know? How could you not see it? It was, you know, looking back, you're like, it was so obvious. But to see that, to actually look and see it was painful. There was a lot of emotion. There was a lot to lose. There was a lot of uncertainty if it was true. So if it was true, he was having an affair, what would happen to my life? And as long as I stood in that blind spot, my life wasn't going to change. But deep inside, I knew the difference. And we've had that conversation about our heart brain, our yep. our cognitive brain and our gut brain. Well, my gut was talking really loud, but I let the heart brain overrule. And I just, I couldn't see it until finally I... I had to, I got the courage, I confronted, it's quite the story, I'm not going to bother you with it now, but um, let's just say I drove to her house because she worked for us, I knew her, she was a friend, I loved her, she she was our front door- desk person and we all hung out, I mean, this was more than just losing a husband, this was losing a friend and losing a business. So just to add that in there, I, I went to the house and his car was there and he came back to the house and I had his bags packed and said, get out. And, and even then I still didn't want to believe it was true. That's how strong it was. I still had a hope that it wasn't true just because he hadn't said the words. So, and oh, go ahead. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that with me and with the listeners, because I think it's important to recognize that. Thank you. It was hard. Trust me. It's still hard. Yeah. yeah, No, absolutely. But so I guess, and I'm hesitating here because I'm trying to think through this as you're telling the story, but does it have something to do with our inability or let me say it this way by not seeing what's going on or admitting that something else is happening. Does that say something of a weakness inside of us? And the reason why I mention that here is because when we talk about the political landscape that we're in, if, and, and with any kind of situation, if I firmly believe in something and I'm going to discount everybody else's belief. And then all of a sudden, I'm struck with the very thing that I'm believing, that I disbelieve so strongly. I'm now forced to have to recant and say I was wrong. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to discount everything about that. And what does that say about me as a person? And you know, so I think there's there there's something to be said there. And that came to mind when you were talking just now. And I get where you're going. And as we go through some of these accounts, like I want to share the account of the doctor since you've read it. I think you mm-hmm. and and like there's always factors at play. And also, too, we need to be kind to ourselves because this is a human phenomenon. It's it's something that, you know, we we need to work on, but we can't, we have to 
practice a few things, which we can talk also talk about at the end to help us avoid it. Like it's going to happen, but how can we avoid it, especially in, in critical moments, right? Yeah, no, I agree. And I know like for me, it was a huge fear of the, first of all, I loved the man madly right. and, and I would lose him. I would lose his family uh, that I loved. His parents were like my parents. I couldn't mm-hmm. love them more. I stayed close to them even after the divorce, but um, it's that whole, uh, that whole family loss. There was two businesses that I had to lose. That was the whole thought that the man I loved you know, so much could betray me, like would do this to me. And there was just like lots of things. So the fear factor was really, really high. Like what would happen to me? And I projected the worst would happen. And, and that's, those are honest feelings. And, and I didn't know there's a lot of unknown out there. And it was only when I did the confrontation and I made, did that, was I able to start to rebuild? And now I look back and I think, man, they went on for almost a year. And if I could have looked at it at least six to eight months earlier, I would have had six or eight months more of my life for me. Right, right. So, right. so there's, if, if we, if we see that there's value in confronting these emotions, I think that that's where you, you can get the strength to confront them. Yeah. And that's, at least that's my opinion. And yeah, I, I mean, think that it will prove true. Yeah, no, no, no. I agree with you. I think it's, 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 it's the fear of stepping into the unknown. It's the fear of, my life is going to be completely disrupted now the way that I've known it to be for so many years. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's that, it's that fear of at least I know what I have now. And am I willing to accept that the way it is now, or am I willing to step into the unknown and make a change? And eventually you realize that you can't live the way that you're living. And you did make that step. And you were able to recover and you've recovered very well by remarrying a wonderful human being. Isn't and he great? He is. He's awesome. He's and a wonderful man. Yeah, he is. And so you were able to take that leap, but you weren't able to take that leap until you made the decision that I don't want to live like this any longer. And that takes time. It, it does, but I'm going to bring up another term that I really love okay. is Effective forecasting. Ah, yeah, I like that term. Yeah, so we think of forecasting with the weather, but we do this all the time as humans. So if we're going to the dentist, we think, oh, I don't want to go to the dentist. We we imagine and the pain and just, oh, they're scraping on my teeth. And then after it's over, you're like, oh, that's not so bad. Or we have a new project to do. We've got to learn something new. Or someone says, here, I want you to do this. And they're like, oh, I can't do that. And you imagine how horrible it's going to be. And after you're done, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. It's because we're effective forecasting. And right. sometimes we do it the other way. Like, oh, I'm so in love and I'm going to get married and marriage is going to make me happy. Well, they find that you're as happy as you are inside and that those are great moments. Like you have highs, but the, that where you land is pretty much where you were before. And in, in, as far as who you are as a person, right? Like you're, you're, uh, What you think is going to make you happy doesn't always make you as happy. And what you think is going to make you sad or angry or upset doesn't always make you angry or upset. Or you think you're going to be happy and you're discontented. So there's we get the emotion wrong and we get the intensity wrong. So in my effective forecasting, my life was going to fall apart. And, you know, it kind of did for a little bit, but I got up really quickly because I was like, I have the power to choose my life now. And anyway, that's, that's my story. But the most impactful story for me in that book was the story of a Dr. Stewart, Alice Stewart. Yes. She 
what is the what she became a doctor in the 40s right uh and she was in a doctor at a time there weren't a lot of women she was a single mother she just was one of these people who liked to figure out why things happen and started really the movement of social medicine in the UK and specifically so the studying of childhood cancers Exactly. She was like, why are these children between the ages of two and four dying at such a high rate? You would have expected it earlier or later, you know, when they're newborn or when they started to go to school. And she went literally door to door and she surveyed this and she did studies and she figured out and had a lot of work to confirm it, that it was because they were x-rating the fetuses. So in vitro, while women are pregnant, they would x-ray. And you have to remember, this is the thing about, you know, about where we are today and where we were yesterday. And it's easy to judge, oh, how could they x-ray fetuses? It's because they just didn't know. It's kind of like bloodletting. They didn't know. Right, they thought right. it was good. <laughs> like it wasn't like with bad intention, that was what they did. And it was a big deal. Like they would x-ray people's feet when they got fitted into shoes. They, it was x-rays were gigantic and there was a lot of investment in x-ray machines in medical facilities. So she was now coming up and saying, Hey, I've got evidence. You're, you're, you're killing babies. So can you imagine how that went over with the medical community? Oh, it was horrible. Yeah, because the X-raying was making a was making people a lot of money, and that was a huge factor in it. So, and the fact that she was a woman and divorced, and it was like she was coming up with these research studies, and they were like, "Nah, I, no, we're still going to do what we're doing, and we're just going to ignore them." And prominent doctors in the field. A couple in particular were trying to disprove her and couldn't. Yep. And it wasn't their idea. So we could have some egos here. Yep. And then where there's a money factor, and that's not a good thing. And there was another factor was that they always thought that there was a tipping point where something was good. Nothing was always bad. It was, you just got to a point and then it was at a safe level. And here she was saying there's no safe level, which was contrary to the belief at that time, according to this, the book. And imagine that she's coming out and telling these physicians, you're killing babies. They don't want to hear that. No, so there's not. a lot of factors to make you not want to believe it. And yet for 25 years, the practice persisted. What year was it that 1980? It was not until 1980 when the American study of X-raying fetuses um, produced the same results as her study did 20 years ago. I think it was 25. Even. 25, yeah. Even 20. It took 20 years for them to, to kind of get to the point where they would accept it. So when you look at that, it's so easy for us to look back and say, boy, how horrible were they? But but it happened. And it's my personal belief that it's happening today with masks. Oh, I agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. And it's not a political, it's beyond a political statement. It's beyond, you know, I still see posts everywhere online where they're trying to politicize it. And it's at the point where it's no longer it can no longer be political because human beings, your fellow neighbors are dying and they're dying at an alarming rate. And if the mask, like you said in the beginning of the podcast, if the mask helps to diminish the particles leaving your body and infecting someone else, then why not use it? And doesn't that seem as obvious as why would you x-ray a baby right. in vitro? Right. 
and and yet there's going to be people who are going to listen to this and say, oh, you don't know, you're taking away my freedom or um, you can't tell me what to do. You're muzzling me. I'm trying to think of everything that I've heard. Oh, for uh, God's uh, sake, uh, our freedoms are taken away from many things daily. So you're that just required to wear cl- yeah. with me. I mean, how you can't wear clothes. Yeah, you have to go to you have to go to the store with clothes on. You have to stop at a red light, or you're going to get a ticket. I mean, come on, bark up a different tree because that doesn't fly with me. Wow, there was a lot of emotion behind that. However, I really do believe that. I know, but I really do believe that because it's like it's like we're choosing to willfully blind ourselves from the other side. We're willingly choosing to turn off. It's almost as if we're listening out of two sides of our head, right? The left ears listening to what my my people and what I believe are saying, and the right ear is deaf to everybody else. And when you live in a society like that, or when you live your personal life like that, you're not being true to yourself. For me... That's the main crisis. It's we are allowing other people to determine our importance and self-worth instead of finding our importance and self-worth within ourselves. And that's that's such a horrible place to be. And yet we, we're seeing it all over the place. It's high emotions that yeah. that are a good sign when you are so emotionally volatile and you see it at all the YouTube and and I'm going to put it across the board. It, it's not just masks. It's it's all different kinds of causes. It's um, there's oh, yeah. not listening to to multiple sides uh, when it comes to Black Lives Matters. When it comes to any school social school yep. reopenings, uh, just anything, any social cause. The the if you can't look objectively. And listen to the other side and be curious about what they're saying and listen and weigh it in because your emotions are so high. That's when you need to force yourself more to listen to it. From my experience, that's how I do it. I listen more to the other side because that's the only way I can bring it down. Is to is to engage, and it sometimes sick makes me sick at my stomach, but I still do it because if I listen, I'm like, there's a good point. If I, but I have to be not listening to say, no, you're wrong. I have to be listening to say, is there any truth in this? Yeah, and I believe right now that the major news organizations are so so polarizing that I don't think we're getting enough information from both sides. In this case, if you listen to the newscasters, they themselves are getting so frustrated with what the other side is doing that they're not even reporting, I don't think, what's accurate, what's completely accurate on both sides. And we go back to, you know, I'm going to surround myself with like-minded individuals because at least I feel like I'm being validated. I'm seeking validation in my belief from someone else. I'm not validating my own belief. I'm validating it based on what other people think of my belief. So if we continue to do that, then we'll never find a balance or a validity in ourselves. It's always going to be based on what other people say and do. And I think that's dangerous. The other thing i i have had to work on and i this is as much about me as it is about anything else for me because i'm always trying to improve myself which is being wrong i have to be okay with being wrong and i know my hackles get up it just happened today i was talking with a friend and Your she hackles. brought up <laughs> my hackles Your yes hackles. She said I'm, I'm all hackled, man. I'm <laughs> hackled. My friend today, we were talking while she was doing her walk, and she brought up a truth about me that I knew was true and I didn't want to hear. And I was like, okay, Kim, 
Don't fight her because she's right. Don't try and justify yourself. <laughs> Just say you're wrong and she's right. And I did. And it was like, oh gosh, that felt so good. And and it it took me a little bit. And you know what? Being wrong and making mistakes is okay. That's how we get growth. If you look at all of the 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 big achievements. There's been a lot of mistakes before they get that big achievement. And and so when it comes to inventions or progress in technology and and even in medicine. So we we learn from our mistakes and it's not an all or nothing. Like let's say the other side, let's go to political just because it's okay. so strong right now. Let's just say the other side is right in this one thing. That doesn't make them right in everything. That doesn't mean that if you agree with Trump or you don't agree with Trump, or if you agree with the Democrats or you don't agree with the Democrats, that it, it doesn't or does make you one. It, it's not an all or nothing. You can agree on a point because it's right, not because it's propagated by some side or another. I totally agree with you on this. And you know, and, and, and look, I'm not immune to it either because there are certain things that I believe in so strongly and it's going to take a lot of influence from someone else to prove me wrong. And I think that gets into my ego, right? That, that, that plays to my ego and it's time right now that we need to learn to tame our ego because it's getting the, it's getting in the way of human life. And you know what? I get it. And I get the fact that the right is worried about the election results that are coming up in November. I get that the left is, you know, concerned about him staying in office. Um, I get all that. But at the end of the day, I have to know that I did everything in my power to prevent myself from exposing someone else in the event that I'm carrying it. That's just me. But to me, that's living with compassion. That's living with empathy. That's living with a tamed ego. And until we start living that way, we're going to see this kind of polarizing, um, polarizing views happen all the time. And it's only going to get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. I I agree. I do. So we've talked about masks. We've talked about medicine, cheating <laughs> husbands. <laughs> what can we do? I think we've just talked about a solution is to be opening to listen to the other side. Seek out disconfirming information and and listen to it which is the hardest part, right? When, when you're yeah. watching, when you're watching the news and your brain's going, you're all wrong, you're all wrong, you're all wrong. Instead of trying to disconfirm what they say, ask, well, what if they were right? What would that look like? And if you ask some of these people, didn't we just, we, we just read this article about a gentleman who preached to his family that it was all a, a hoax. He got it and spread it to 14 of his family members and lost, an, uh, I think, his mother-in-law. Lost his mother-in-law, <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Lost his mother-in-law. And now he's like, yeah, I was wrong. It, are you so strong in your conviction that you're willing to take the risk? Or does it need to happen in your family for you to believe differently? That's the same question that, has been asked for centuries. If I don't see it happening, it's not affecting me. But just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not happening. You know, it's like the tree in the forest in Australia is still falling. Even though you're in America, the tree still fell. So you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, 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 if I don't see it, it doesn't affect me. And until I do see it, I'm going to stay, you know, stand my course. But here's the thing. I go back to what our guest Angie said back on the podcast when we did the um, interview with her on boundaries. It was brought up in that podcast that what you are saying yes to, you're saying no to something. And 
I want people to really think about that. If you're going to promote a cause or if you're going to promote a certain belief system that you have in your mind and you say yes to that, what are you saying no to? Because are you willing to say no to everything that comes after that? Are you, do you believe that strongly that you're going to say no to everything? And if you're not, then that's the moment when you can say, all right, I think there's something here and maybe I need to be a little bit more open to another perspective or to another point of view or to another scientific discovery that maybe I'm not right because I'm not willing to say no to everything. If that's where it is, if that's what it takes, then maybe that's the key for you. It is for me. Now, that's a, this is a, a pretty heavy subject, and I expect that if we get enough listeners, we're going to get a lot of feedback on oh, the fact probably. that, <laughs> that um, they, they're going to feel their ire, um, their yeah. passion. And I say, great, just question it. Just yeah, exactly. be, be mad at me, but just look and think, is there anything to what I say? Can you find any truth? And if there's absolutely no truth, and uh, just going back to, to masks, because I'll, I'll tell you that our, our emotions lie to us. And there's they are not the best source of truth when it comes to making a decision. Going back to another podcast where we talked about balancing the cognitive, the heart and the gut. I told you earlier, I knew in my gut what was true about my situation at home. And I, I ignored it because my heart said, no, you don't listen to that. So we need to listen to our gut we need to look at what is being said. Is there any truth in it? And also to the source. Yeah. Sources I mean, are super important. They are. And, you know, it's, it's, it's conspiracy stuff. And, you know, if you can see through the conspiracy and look at the facts that are laid out in front of us, then you're able to make the best decision that you can make. But if you can't see through that conspiracy theory idea, then I, then I don't know what the answer is because, you know, we have to, we have to be able to take a step back. We have to take ourselves out of the situation and look at it from all sides. Because again, when you flip a coin in the beginning of a football game, it's going to be heads or tails. It's not just going to be one side. You've got to look at the other side. Yeah. It's only, it's only fair to yourself. It's for, forget about anybody else. It's fair to you. You know, it's, it's allowing you to be informed in a way that you're able to make the decision that not only benefits you, But in return, because of that decision, it's benefiting the people around you in a positive way. It's an emotion management tool. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, this was a big conversation today, John. Yeah. But it feels good to get it out. It feels good to get it out. I've been wanting to talk about that. I've been wanting to talk about this subject for a while. Yeah. I mean, it feels good to get it out. It's, it's, you know, it's like I, I don't feel... I don't know. I don't feel any better. Or I don't feel like we, you know, resolved the, the issue, but you know, it's getting the conversation going in a different direction. And I think that's what needs to be done. You know, if the news reporting would do that, take it in a different direction, refocus it, you know, repackage it, then I think we, we would be better off because really none of us, well, some of you listeners might be, but Kim and I aren't um, epidemiologists. We're not, you know, scientists, um, infection disease scientists. So we can only get our information from the sources where you get your information from. Um, the, but, but if we don't question it, then, you know, we're doing ourselves a disservice in the long run. 
It's true. And on that n- note, I found yeah. a couple of websites that are really nice and I go to to get um, both sides of the story. So you don't have to what get it from TV. You can yeah. go, there's Divided We Fall. There's, um, I really like All Sides Now. I know uh, there's some, a new one that's launched and I can't think of the name. But look for unbiased news. Do a search. Yeah, there's a D. There's a news news thing called I think it's D M, or D W. It's called D W. It's not a U.S. news source. It's a European news source. Um, and I listen to the first fifteen minutes of the NPR broadcast because they're just reporting the news, and then it's after the fifteen minutes when it gets to um, to opinion based news, which I personally find horrible so um so i listen to that first 15 minutes where it's just reporting the news just just as a uh as an a way to kind of calm ourselves in this situation and i think we're just so focused on that right now because it is so polarizing and uh if we as a country are going to get out of this mess if We've already seen, like to me, this is like seems so obvious. We've already seen that when we let go of the reins, the case cases go skyrocketing. We've yep. we've we've seen ten thousand deaths in like a month or something like That's that. Crazy, it's crazy. I, I I know we've gone past uh, one hundred and fifty thousand. The point is, is that when we stayed in. It went down. So if we really want to open up our economy, it seems to me wearing a mask is the way to do it. Or at least, yeah, at least part of it, you know. One other thing that I don't want to, I don't want to leave this conversation without saying this. And this goes for anything that we, anything that comes out of our mouth, anything that we say on a daily basis. The, this is what I want to say. Watch the rhetoric that comes out of your mouth. I watch it come out of my mouth all the time. Sometimes it comes right out and it goes right into the gutter. And then I'm like, ah, damn it. Why did I say that? Be conscious of the rhetoric we use. When we call people stupid, when we call people in derogatory terms, like we were talking yesterday about now the new thing about the Karen and the Richards, Uh, you know, this is, these are derogatory statements. They can be presented funny, but that doesn't mean that they're funny. So the rhetoric that we use has a huge impact on what we actually believe. So be very careful and be cautious of the rhetoric that we use because that sets a statement that you might not want out there and you might not truly believe either. So be careful. More more importantly, neurons that wire together, fire together. together. Yes. So we're going to go back to that. And that means that in our brain, we, we lay down neuronal paths. And the more we have a thought, the deeper entrenched, well, I should say, the more we think a thought, the deeper entrenched it becomes, the faster it, it gets launched. Yep. And our thoughts are not launched consciously. Most of them are unconsciously launched. The The thoughts just come out. We think we're thinking and we're not. And if you want to learn more about that, join my Emotion Chef program. The, the, the point of all this is that you lay that thought in and it becomes deeper and it gets harder to get rid of. And the only way you can undo the depths of its connectivity is to not do it, to not have that thought and to replace it with different thoughts. So it's a conscious effort. It takes, it takes mindfulness. It takes effort, but in the end it becomes more natural and you will start to question yourself more and you'll find yourself having different thoughts and behaving and reacting differently. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And I have to tell you, Kim, I'm absolutely exhausted. So I'm tired. Let's hope too. things, you know, let's hope things change um, for the better, for the better of humanity, because you know it's 
we need to take care of ourselves. And by doing that, we can take care of other people. But we can't take care of other people until we take care of ourselves. And I just kind of want to go back to we focus so much on this this looming COVID and political landscape. But willful blindness affects us in lots of ways. Not looking at behaviors of our spouses or uh, our children, um, our, how things are in our life. And so this is a practice when you can, if you can practice examining your emotional responses, this will give you better control over your willful blindness. Nothing's ever, especially with our brains, it's just way too complicated. Perfect. But it's at least a way to improve it and to yeah. fight it. Yeah, because it's not absolute. I mean, there's always going to be risks and you know, you know things that you know that you're giving up to do a certain thing. or But if you don't even recognize that those risks are there or that those things are there, then that's willful blindness. And that needs to... Just be aware of that. Just be aware of that. You know? All right. All right, Kim. Well, listen, have a great rest of your week. And um, I need a jet because I have to jump in the shower and take my friend to get to her eye doctor's appointment. You mean to wash your, wash your hair? Or wash your head? my hair. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, go online and see John. He's bald. So I always tease him like, how long does it take to do your hair in the morning? (laughs) I've got long hair and lots of it. So it's a little different. I love it. All right. Well, thank you to our listeners who join us every Saturday. Kim, have a great week. You too, John. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. shows are available every Saturday right here on heartmindify.podbean.com or wherever you listen. Kim and I would like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to be a small part of your life. Be kind to yourself and remember, our hearts tell the story, but our mind is the conductor.